Good afternoon and welcome to Cybers Today. I'm Nadine DeRaza. And I'm Stephen Chair. Coming up, CEO and chairperson of the EuroClear Group, Lever Mostre, will be speaking to us about their collaboration with the ECB. And we'll be previewing the annual Cybos Quiz. Looking forward to that. And we'll also be getting another insider's view on what's best about living in Toronto. Now, in Australia, they are pioneering one of the most exciting new payment infrastructures in the world. The new payments platform, or NPP, will enable real-time clearing and settlement for simple and complex payments between Australian personal and business bank accounts. So to tell us all about the NPP, we're joined by Katrina Stewart, who is Executive Manager, Engagement for New Payments Platform Australia, and also by Paul Franklin, the General Manager Payment at the National Australia Bank. Welcome, both of you. Welcome to the show. (laughs) Katrina, I'll start with you. What is the new payments platform in Australia and who's involved? Uh, So it's a major industry initiative to develop brand new infrastructure um, to enable fast, versatile and data-rich payments 24 by 7 for 365 days of the year. Um, In terms of who's involved, we have 13 founding um, institutions who were basically contributing to to the build and development of the the platform. Uh, They include our major banks, they include some of the payment aggregators, international banks and also the Reserve Bank of Australia. Uh, And SWIFT, uh, of course, has also been involved as the actual um, builder of of the infrastructure. As Sounds well. a very exciting initiative, you know, world class mm. as well. Paul, if I could bring you in, uh, what would be the first product to be on the NPP platform? Uh, so there are uh, two things that will be launched first. Uh, the, one is a single credit transfer, which is a very basic payment message. Uh, and then uh, the second is an overlay service, which we've called OSCO. Uh, and it's a uh, consumer value proposition, the ability to make a um, person-to-person payment uh, with service levels attached to it. Um, that'll give consumers the promise that their payments will be made within a a number of seconds. Um, Customers will be able to make a payment to a um, sort code or BSB number and account number and they'll also be able to use a uh, pay ID uh, which could be a mobile phone number, an email address or an Australian business number or an organisation identifier. There's quite a lot of flexibility Mm. from day one. Mm. So there's great flexibility for the consumer, but uh, we often don't think about the kind of back end involved. And I know there is a lot, a lot Mm. of collaboration between competing banks as well. Uh, Katrina, how has that been coming along? Uh, So it's been a a huge uh, industry effort in terms of the collaboration. We've had hundreds of people who are working in in the participating financial organisations all dedicated to bringing this to life. Um, So it's such a a huge undertaking. I I think one of the the key successes of the platform has been to define the areas where those financial institutions will collaborate. So... uh, really emphasising that the collaboration needs to be around the infrastructure itself, around the data and the message standards, uh, and then there'll be the competition around the product layer, uh, as well as the customer interfaces um, and and how that will work. So, uh, you know, I think we've we've clearly delineated between where people are going to collaborate and where they're going to compete. A labour of love, it sounds like. (laughs) It's like a lot of people involved in that. And Paul, from your point of view, what makes MPP so different to other real-time payment systems in the world? So there's a couple of things. The first is that the um, the infrastructure is distributed uh, between uh, gateways that are held by each of the participating institutions. So there'll be uh, one for each of the 13 um, members or the uh, participants uh, and a separate one held by the Reserve Bank of Australia. Um, so there's not a single um, hub in the centre of, um, of the network um, that's distributed. Um, the message flows are a little different. So uh, we'll be sending a... Um, clearing request and getting a confirmation back before we settle. Um, Line by line settlement is an unusual thing. So this is essentially real time gross settlement on a vast scale. Uh, And the architecture has been built so that um, we've got the basic infrastructure with um, network uh, settlement, the, um, the switching capability and the settlement service, but the ability to add new products over the top of that, which we call overlay services. Uh, So when we want to launch a new type of payment in the future, we don't need to rebuild the network and the switching capability or the settlement capability. We can just define um, how we want that overlay service to work uh, and build that relatively quickly. Well, not reinventing the wheel is always a good thing, isn't Uh, it? It's important because the system will continue to grow and evolve and you want to have options for that available. Katrina, uh, you mentioned earlier how SWIFT has been involved in this as well. What Mm. has been your perception of the support that SWIFT has been providing? Uh, I think SWIFT has been an excellent partner. Um, They've been a real pleasure to to work with. Uh, I think they have really demonstrated uh, a real commitment in terms of their 
uh, commitment to the timeframes and also uh, produce really high quality uh, co-delivery as well um, and being able to really demonstrate some strong expertise um, in, the, in their area. Um, and you know, we've, we've thoroughly enjoyed the partnership and we really look forward to continuing that partnership as we move forward as well. So. And how will the actual overlay service work in practice? In practice, so everybody asks that question. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I'm going to ask it again. <laughs> right. So overlay services are designed to be the tailored payment experiences that the customers are going to see. Um, and they're open to basically uh, any uh, organisation, as long as they're registered for business in Australia, would be able to develop an overlay service. And it's going to be up to the overlay service provider to determine what's the actual product set. So how does it work in terms of the messaging, the data set, uh, how will the flows work, what's the customer experience and the SLA, um, and the, the provider will be responsible for managing that as an ongoing product. Um, it'll be up to the participants, such as uh, National Australia Bank, to decide are they going to opt into that service and offer it to their customers. Um, and really, you know, as we look at sort of potential use cases, uh, it, it's really going to be wide and varied, um, which is the exciting part of, of the platform. So uh, the use cases could be anywhere from looking at um, an industry vertical type of opportunity. So in industries such as securities, uh, insurance or, or pension or superannuation, as we call it in Australia, uh, where there's a lot of opportunity for efficiency gains, uh, for you know, improvements in customer service and also cost reduction. Um, those overlay services might be something that go across industries. Right. So it could be something like e-invoicing, where there's a lot of potential for opportunity to, to improve efficiency and reduce reconciliation effort across multiple industries. Uh, or could even be um, more of a utility type of overlay that may not even have a customer-facing brand. It could be uh, fraud or KYC, for example. Mm -hmm. So really, the possibilities are endless. Yeah, they are, aren't they? Really exciting. Loads of possibilities. Well, Paul, I have to ask you then, what are some of the overlay services that uh, most excite you? Uh, so I think, firstly, there's a lot of flexibility built in this into the single credit transfer. So for many uses, uh, it won't even be necessary to have an overlay services. Uh, I think overlay services will be appropriate where either we want to enforce a different message standard to meet the needs of a particular industry, uh, or where the orchestration needs to change. Uh, an example of that might be uh, in settling a um, for a trade in some um, commodity or property um, where you need to do delivery versus payment. Um, the uses where uh, the format's important might be for pension payments, as Katrina suggested, uh, or things like e-invoicing, where we want to ensure that the data we deliver with the payment meets the needs of the, um, um, the invoicer. And Paul, how could businesses use MPP to, to grow? Uh, so I think there's a number of really interesting business models. Uh, the value propositions that we're delivering are uh, richer data, um, real-time payment, um, and um, you know, an example of real-time payment that um, might be different is um, if you want to buy a car on a weekend, um, you might test drive the car. Um, at the moment, a lot of people might go to the bank on a Monday to get a bank check, go back and pick up the car. But having test driven the car, they really want to drive it away right away. So the businesses that, the lending businesses that thrive in that environment will be the ones who can fulfill the payment in real time. Um, and, and I think um, businesses all have different needs. Um, there's potential also for a huge amount of cost saving uh, if you can better identify uh, what a payment's for or if you can sell goods faster to customers uh, because you've got a real-time payment, then they're the opportunities, I think, for businesses to grow. Mm. And Katrina, what kind of customer reach do you expect to have as this rolls out in the first year? Uh, so we're expecting to have very strong reach uh, at the outset. So we're anticipating that we'll have probably three out of every four bank accounts in Australia that will be reachable by the platform. Obviously, that'll continue to, to grow and evolve over time so that um, within sort of uh, 18 months or so, we expect to be close to 100%. So... And Paul, from your point of view, um, when you think about the different demographics, because you can see this working with millennials and other age groups, mm -hmm. although my mum and dad are sort of 80, they do have mobile phones. <laughs> my dad, whether he takes it out is another matter. But when you think about the offering to elderly people, mm -hmm. how are you going to make sure that elderly people are catered for, particularly if they don't have mobile phones? So, I, firstly, I think it's important that the customer experience is really um, easy to use for everybody, whether you're 15 or 85. Um, and you know, we do put a lot of effort into making sure that uh, we deliver a great customer experience. Um, then there's a choice of channels. Um, uh, most people have access to some sort of electronic device, um, but a lot of branches in Australia still have iPads available in the branch. So if you 
genuinely have no uh, access to uh, electronic devices at home, you can still go to the branch and your needs to see your payments and receive your payments will be, uh, will be met that way. So you're doing everything you can to help any generation. Yeah, well, absolutely. And I think it'll take a bit of time for people to, to get over the idea as well, to understand the platform, you know, to, uh, yeah. before they appreciate it. Uh, but we have to ask you, so when does this all happen? When does it go live? So technical go live is uh, before, the, before Christmas. Yeah. Uh, it's expected next month. Um, now, um, the launch to customers after a period of testing uh, will be early in 2018. Uh, we're expecting that in February. Okay. And when will the full launch be, Katrina? That's assuming that the pilot is successful. Yep. <laughs> uh, so uh, we're basically looking at February next year. Uh, that's when banks will start to, to offer out the, the products and services to customers. And it'll continue to evolve. So we'll have more uh, banks coming on board as well during the year and more products coming to market as well. So. And what have you been seeing here at Cybos? Because I know you've come all the way from Sydney. Yeah, I know right. next year you're going to have an easier journey. That's right. 20-minute uh, commute. I'm looking yes, forward to it. Yes, indeed. So what, what else have you been seeing that's inspired you? Um, uh, I've really enjoyed visiting the, the fintech area, so the inner tribe, uh, as well as in the fintech marketplace. Um, and also just spending some time in the exhibition hall to, to meet some of the people. But uh, actually for me, one probably one of the most uh, uh, valuable parts of Cybos has been to connect with others in other markets who are dealing with similar issues and, and looking at other real-time payments in other markets. Mm -hmm. Paul? Cool. Uh, I've really enjoyed the um, large number of banks who are really excited about Swift GPI. Um, on the cross-border side, we see that as a huge um, uh, improvement in the service that Swift offers uh, to, uh, and the banks can offer to our customers. Uh, NAB was actually the first bank to go live with uh, GPI using APIs, and um, I think that's uh, generating a lot of interest. Um, and we're looking forward to um, a lot of improvements in the cross-border payments experience. And how about tomorrow? Anything lined up for you to see and do? Uh, just more conversations and... Uh, more inner tribe. More inner <laughs> tribe. <laughs> I'm actually looking forward to the ice hockey tonight. Oh, <laughs> are you, are you, about that. Where the are you maple, going? Uh, the maple leaves are playing not far from here. Okay. That's not very Australian. Yeah. <laughs> how did you, you get got a onto that? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> oh, well, and looking very happy about it as well. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Thank you all Now, for thank you in. very much for both coming along. Wish you all the greatest success with the pilot And you know what? Program. The next time we meet, hopefully in Sydney, we can all be making payments with our phones. Indeed. That's there right. You go. And you give an update on it as well. We Brilliant. certainly will. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Now, let's find out a little bit more about this fascinating city from a lifestyle blogger dedicated to all things, of course, Toronto. I'm Sasha Exeter, and I'm the founder of a lifestyle website here in Toronto. My vision, my future, it defines my past. I've been looking and I found it at last. Toronto is my home and it's been instrumental for my healing. I am pulled in a million different directions every day. Taking that hour or two out of my day just for me is absolutely necessary for, you know, my mind, my body, my spirit. really nice to have access to pockets of green space and parks and hiking trails so close to the city. So you almost sometimes feel like you're out of the city when you're still quite here. Moonlight rises from the shore. After I'm done taking my me time, I love to hit up the Roncesville neighborhood. I love Roncesville because it's just so small and family oriented. Every time I'm there, I feel like I'm in an urban environment, but it's much more relaxed and easygoing and laid back. What does it take for me to reach my sublime? I really love getting out in the city in the evening time with my friends and going to restaurants and joining fine dining. I try to live every day in the city like it's my last. is home is my center and I need to be here.
Well, I hope that's inspired you to go out and about. Um, some yeah. lovely films there. Uh, I, I do like the idea of a lot of greenery around the city. I've been yes. walking out every now and then, and it's lovely to see some green spaces among all the buildings. It's a beautiful day out there. I've got 10 it minutes is. outside that's as well. But there's so much on offer here that there's so much to do. Anyway, now collaboration between market infrastructures and the ECB is critical to provide a robust, reliable, safe market. Well, earlier I spoke to Liva Mostre, CEO of Euroclear, and I asked her to tell us how Euroclear and the ECB are working together. Well, I think if we look at all what is happening in our environment, be that target to securities, be that CSD regulation, be that also recovery and resolution, these are all aiming at three goals for the European markets. The first goal is to make sure that there is more European integration. The second goal is to make sure that the financial markets are more stable by having very robust financial market infrastructures in there. And then the third reason is to aim for more competition. Now, if we take a step back and we look together how far we have achieved on those three goals, I would say on the goal of financial market stability, I think we have progressed a whole lot with one caveat, which is a new emerging risk, and I guess we will come back to it, it's a cybersecurity. But on the classical risks, be them operational risks, be them market risk, credit and liquidity risk, I believe we have made a big step in advance for the security of our markets. So I would say a very good achievement there. On the European integration, I always say, I feel we are swimming a bit in the middle of the river. Uh, swimming in the middle of the river, we have infrastructure. We have that joined up now. The waves for T2S are behind us. But still, at the end of the day, we don't see that much pickup yet. Uh, on, on cross-border uh, transactions happening over T2S, and we can do still a lot more uh, together with all infrastructures. Uh, I believe there also um, there is a bit of more political will needed, and we also probably need more harmonization in the markets. And I would say for the more competition goal, that also applies. Again, we don't see that much competition yet uh, in our market infrastructures across Europe. And we believe that is related to a lack of harmonization. And there are a number of initiatives ongoing there. There is the European Post-Trade Forum, uh, which lo is looking very cl uh, clearly at what is still remaining from the Giovannini barriers that were in place a number of years ago. And that is also looking at potentially new barriers that have come into the space. So that is a bit where we stand and where we feel Euroclear as a financial market infrastructure and ECB share exactly the same goals. Of the areas you mentioned though, where do you think or which would be the most challenging at this point in time? Well, um, I think if you look at it from the risk angle, cybersecurity is a big risk and it's a very big challenge that we all share as an ecosystem and we are all in the same boat there. I would say if we look at for our objectives to get to more Europe, there we say uh, on making it more harmonized for issuers because at the end of the day, it's not the CSD that sits there in the infrastructure, but it is for the issuer, what does it mean? means to issue in a certain country under a certain legal regime, their harmonization uh, a lot still needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Well, technology is helping bridge and also help with the harmonization, but at the same time, as you mentioned, security risks are there. So cybersecurity, very much a big issue also here at yes. Cybos. I mean, the challenges you think you'll be facing in terms of cybersecurity? Well, as, uh, as we are looking at cyber security, I think there are a number of dimensions worth our attention. First of all, there's clearly technology. Technology is around avoiding vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities with patching, with, with, with access management, but it's also around monitoring. It's around monitoring your perimeter to ensure nothing goes in. But it's also around monitoring outgoing uh, activity. It's around profiling, uh, using big data. What are normal patterns? What uh, will you detect abnormal patterns? And the going out is just as important because you can't assume uh, hackers won't get in. 
Um, so this, these are a part of the, the technology angles, uh, but there is also a big people dimension. Uh, working a lot on people awareness is also very high on our agenda. And then thirdly, I also see a big regulatory challenge around cyber. Because on the one hand, cyber supersedes financial markets and it gets the attention also of defense authorities in the different countries where we operate. And uh, the last thing we want is to have to have a set of rules by country in a non-harmonized way. Right. Because uh, we need to use our energy as targeted as possible and as efficient as possible because the hackers uh, always tend to be, uh, I would say, a bit ahead of the right. curve. And it's, uh, we are fighting one against many. And so we need harmonization, we need a regulatory agenda, but regulatory agendas usually spread over multiple years. If you look at the classical risks, we have uh, regulation setting that takes a while, then compliance that takes a while, and that sits against a very fast moving threat landscape. And that's where we need to find ways, together with the regulators, to be more agile and to make sure that we are not, as an industry, working against fighting yesterday's battle and in the meantime being exposed against new things for which regulation is by far not yet in place. Right. But we have to consider that we are, as an industry, there in the same boat and market infrastructures sit quite centrally there and have to look at how, to, how we avoid also propagation of those risks and how our response can be somewhat different than the responses we have seen in classical um, BPCs, uh, business continuity practices. So these are really big challenges because the hackers, the bad guys, are not bound by the same rules that we have. Exactly. They can do whatever they want. Exactly. But at the same time, should regulation look to the private sector to lead the way or should regulators be trying to champion that? I mean, it's uh, who moves first in order for us to try and stay as competitive as the bad guys? I think the question is not who moves, who moves first. I believe we all have to move. And, and, and we, uh, the private sector cannot wait for a regulation to be in place against that. That would mean too much vulnerability. On the other hand, it is as private sector or duty to feed all what we see uh, into our partners in the ecosystem and the regulators are for sure a partner there. So we all have to move. There's, there's, there's no yep. place for one waiting for the other. And definitely greater awareness for people like ourselves because exactly, exactly. it really is a full ecosystem. It is indeed, indeed, indeed. So how is Euroclear dealing with such new technologies in the financial industry? So um, as, you, as Euroclear and as a financial market infrastructure, on the one hand, we are in our business for re resilience and robustness. So we are not about the first movers in bringing in the big changes, experimenting on our core business. Um, we, are, we have to be aware of having for ourselves more than 28 trillion of assets uh, on our books. So we have to be very careful. On the other hand, we find it very useful to work and to experiment with a number of fintech companies because we are learning a lot from them. And we observe that they come with new ideas, that they challenge us, and that they give us insights that maybe from our prudence stand, uh, standpoint, we would not have uh, embraced immediately. And we'll say, well, that's interesting thinking. And on the other hand, they may cut corners uh, where we say, well, from a resilience angle, be careful because this and that. So we find it a very fruitful collaboration and we try to work with many on different fronts. Uh, if you look at uh, our innovation agenda, we have things like DLT on our agenda, but obviously we have more things than TLT. Uh, we also work on uh, robotics, a very interesting area for financial market infrastructure. And we are also looking at artificial intelligence. Uh, I was talking about pattern analysis and self-learning algorithms, for instance, in the cyberspace. But we also find it in business-related areas, like looking at sanctions, uh, screening prospectus of, of securities that are issued. So it's, it's, it's very exciting. And I would cite, as a last example, the collab collaboration that we have with Taskeyes. 
we leave it as a kind of an independent company, although we are a majority stakeholder and a majority shareholder there. And we bring it to our clients because we find it a huge opportunity to make the collaboration beyond the STP sphere much more effective. Okay. It is a kind of a chat tool uh, where people in the industry compare notes when things go wrong uh, and things fall outside the STP. And we find it very helpful. But we find it helpful to work with those fintech companies uh, a bit at arm's length. Mm -hmm. We don't try to eat it and absorb it in, in the big machine that we are. Uh, and we learn a lot of all those experiments. And that's a good thing because I think the advantage they can bring to you is that different perspective. And that's the reason why they can add value to a company such as Euroclear. Exactly, exactly. So we try to remain master of the agenda and see where does the value come. But then on how the value comes, they bring a lot to us. And that's the collaboration model we try to put in place. But are there challenges in doing that? Is it difficult to sometimes harmonize that relationship, so to speak? Well, I think you have to be realistic. Not everything you try in the innovation agenda will be a success. And I always say the innovation agenda is also one where you have to agree and accept that you fail fast. And, and you, you're going to have a few failures around the road, but if you don't accept that that is part of it, you won't reach the successes either. And that's, that's the philosophy we are looking at it uh, at Euroclear. So how do you work with the ECB on collateral liquidity? Well, uh, collateral, it's a space in which I believe uh, already today uh, it's all about moving collateral around the ecosystem as quickly as possible. I compare it a bit to the just-in-time in the supply chain in the industry. Well, collateral, it's all about being there just in time and just of the required quality so that everybody can optimize the portfolios. And the ECB has a number of topics in ensuring that ECB uh, usage of collateral comes into T2S and we are the right conduit there. But it goes beyond that. We have a very open model. We call it our collateral highway where uh, other stakeholders can say to their clients you want to have one optimized view, one optimization engine across different pools. We can replicate pools even that sit not on our books. And that is a strength of our model and that is also where our collaboration with DTC comes in because there we are allowing clients to mobilize collateral across the Atlantic. Usually we sit on the other side, now we sit on this side of the Atlantic, but it is both directions moving collateral from the DTCC pool and the Euroclear pool in order to mobilize it for each and every use the client can have until T2S yeah. where we are through different channels closely connected. Oliver, thanks so much for sharing those insights. It's been wonderful talking to you. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Stephen. It was good to talk to you. Well, that's all from us today. We'll be back tomorrow at 9 with Good Morning Cybos. When we'll be bringing you highlights of today's must-see event, mm. the Cybos Quiz. And wow. hopefully Julia Streets will be back here. It's the Quiz Master. Yes. <laughs> What's going to happen is two teams will be pitting their wits to take home the coveted Cybos Quiz trophy. So I wonder who's going to win. So please go along and cheer on your favourite team. And that's at 4.45 in the Swift Institute. But coming up next from Conference Room 3, what is next on the wish list of the Corporate Treasurer for Global Payments Innovation? From us, until tomorrow, have a wonderful evening. Good night. Bye-bye. <laughs>